Good. Well, we are going to now go into the talk straight away. So, um, I'm going to read some Bible in a moment, but just by way of introduction, we've been looking at our values that inform what we do here at Network Church Sheffield. We've looked at dependence on God. At the moment, we're looking at being in community, called together in community. And I just want to remind you of some key points about why we think that's important. I think it's clear in the Bible that we work out our following of Jesus, our discipleship of Jesus, together. We're not called to be lone believers. We are called to work out our salvation, work out what it means to be a follower of Jesus with others who are choosing to do the same. And together, we look like Jesus. We're not called to do it on our own. I don't think it is a valid thing to say, I'm just going to go off and be myself as a Christian. Don't think it's, that's a biblical way of being. There are times when we go off and we, t we take ourselves off to a quiet place. We may go off on retreat. Of course, those are good times, but it's always in order to come back together to be part of the body together. Together, we look like Jesus. That's a really, really important thing. And the second thing that I want us to hold on to as we talk about community is that you are important to this community. It is not just about you or me coming and going, what can I get out of this community? That will be part of it. And there'll be times when we will particularly need to lean on God and lean on our community and lean on the friendship and lean on the uh, prayers of our brothers and sisters here. But we can't come with the attitude of, it's just about what I'm going to get. If you are part of this church, then I believe God has brought you here with the gifts that you have, with the character that you have, in order to enable us to be a fuller expression of who Jesus is. If you don't come to this, if you don't join in with what you are bringing, then we will be the poorer for it. We will be the poorer for it. And I believe you are here with, who, with what you've got for a reason. And together, as you bring those gifts, we will become a fuller expression of who Jesus is. Okay, those are the kind of headlines for why we're talking about community. I think that is the way that God has formed his church that, so that he brings together different people, different backgrounds, different giftings, and together we look like him and we become a sign of the future kingdom to people that look on. If I was to ask you, someone who doesn't know this church, a friend of yours maybe, knows you go to this church and they said, rather than tell me about your church, send me a picture that reflects what your church is like. I wonder what would you send? What picture would you send them? What would you think would be the best picture that you could send to this friend that would reflect, if you like, who we are as a church? Would you take a picture of this? Would that be what you would take? Would you take a picture of food bank or restore? It's a bit unfair, really, because you probably would want to take a number of different pictures to reflect the fullness of it. But it's an interesting question, isn't it? What would you take... What for you is church that would be reflected in the picture is really what I'm asking. I came across this picture, which is called, the, I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but called the Fractio Panis. It's one of the earliest pictures we have of the Christian church. And you can see, that if, if you like, this is a picture of, that I think reveals very much what church, what was valued in church in the early church. And they're sitting around a table... They're eating a meal together, the seven people, they think there's six men and one woman, and they're eating a meal together, and as part of that meal, they're breaking bread and they're drinking wine. It's a thanksgiving meal. Now, one of the key things I want us to know about the early church and about what I think God's heart and the way the early church practiced um, being together was that they did it together around in households around a meal table i think actually we've made communion into something that it probably wasn't meant to be sometimes it was often around a meal you know that everyday thing that we do together and in the middle of that meal they would always give thanks to god they would break bread and they would give thanks to god it was a key part of who they were 
If you looked at the early church, it was, yeah, it was part of their common life together. To get, today, we're going to share communion together. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why this practice is so important to the followers of Jesus. But I want us to, right at the beginning, know that it was the center of gravity, if you like, for the early church. It was a place of thanksgiving. That's where we get the word Eucharist from. Eucharist means thanksgiving. Whenever they met, they would give thanks. They'd break bread. It was part of their common life together. Part of the way that I came to faith, and I've said this before, is round a table eat, uh, eating a, a simple meal and drinking a cup of coffee. And I, I wasn't a Christian, but I sat around a table with these other Christians. And as part of the everyday thing that we do, every day where we sit and we eat together, as part of that, I heard them talk about Jesus. And I came to faith through that. I realized that I wanted that. So for me, the image of a table and fellowship around a table is really, really important. But I think it's a key thing for the whole of us as a church in terms of um, it, it reflects that common life. And in the middle of that common life, we give thanks and we break bread. And we remember that the person that draws us together in that common life is Jesus. Drawn together around worship of Jesus. Communion with Jesus and community with each other, the two go together. As we are in communion with Jesus, as we focus on him, he draws us together in community. It's the overflow of our focus on him. Second thing I want to say is the communion at table is a point towards which the past and the future face. So the past is remembered, what Jesus has done. But we also look towards the future realization of the kingdom of God. When one day the heavenly banquet prepared for all mankind will be the banquet table that we all sit round for those of us who, you know, those who have followed Jesus and have come to know Jesus. That that's the future enacting, if you like. When we, when we take communion, we're remembering what Jesus did, the past, but we're also looking forward to the future for what will one day be fully realized. It's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. Sometimes the liturgy that we say, says this a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all mankind. Summed up in this verse from 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, says Paul, you announce the Lord's death until he comes. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, says Paul, you announce the Lord's death, looking to the past, until he comes, looking to the future. If you like, the past and the future converge on this present practice that we do together in communion. I'm just going to go back now, Sarah, and I'm going to read the Bible. I've gone on, gone on a little bit longer, but I want to come back to the Bible now. So this is from 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 to 17. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, sorry, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. The idea that together as we draw around the, 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 the practice of communion and as we break the bread, we're reminding ourselves that the thing that the person that draws us together, that enables, facilitates, and it actually enables us to be community is Jesus. Words that we use often in communion, aren't they? We are one body, for we all share the one loaf, that focus on him. Then, then from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I just want to then... Uh, final bits of scripture from Psalm 23, which I think communion alludes to and reminds us of. And this is a, a prayer of David to, to God. He said to God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And particularly that I think is reminding us of the future recollection, that future hope that we have as we celebrate communion, that one day this banquet, which we are just in some way symbolizing now, one day that banquet around which all the people of God will be gathered will be fully realized. And that is, that is the culmination of the history of God, that one day he will make all things new and heaven will invade earth fully and it will be all made the way it was originally meant to be. That's, again, something that we are holding on to here. So just briefly to look at the remembering the death of Jesus and then looking a little bit more at what it means to consider the future recollection, the future hope that we have in him. N.T. Wright says this, The present moment when we celebrate communion, the present moment, somehow holds together the one-off past event, the Lord's death, and the great future when God's world will be remade under Jesus' loving rule until he comes. Past and future come rushing together into the present, pouring on an ocean of meaning into the little bottle of now. So remembering the death of Jesus and that in his body being broken, the consequences of our sin are being dealt with by his dying. That's what we're doing when we remember the past. And the key thing here is, and that I think speaks into us talking about community, is that it reminds us that it's a level playing field. You remember I said there's no Premier League Christians. Whatever you think you are, whether you think you are really sinful or just a little bit sinful, it's, it's irrelevant. We all are unworthy to come to the table. All of us are unworthy. I got this picture because, you know, just to highlight how unfair it would be if a playing field was like that, built like that. It would be stacked against the team. Um, Beth, my daughter, plays football every Saturday, and some of the pitches she has to play on, I mean, honestly, it's really stacked against you. (laughs) But I guess you have two halves, so you do get to play on the other side, the, the second half. But communion is a level playing field. If you like, we all come to it. We don't kneel in this church particularly because there's nowhere to kneel really. But I, I love that image of whatever, whoever we are, however important we are in the eyes of the world, however important we think we are ourselves, we all are at the same level before this bread and before this wine. It's a level playing field. There, are no, there is no person who is worthy to come to this table. But because of his worthiness, we can come. It's a level playing field. And I love that about that because that creates, that, that creates the sort of community that God wants. A community that isn't about egos. It isn't about who's the most important Christian, who's got the most important job. It's about a family of people that know the reason that they are able to be together. The reason that we are able to be in this room together worshiping Jesus is because of what he has done, not because of any worthiness of our own. That's a really leveling thing to know and a really important thing for us to have as a value and a key thing that informs our community. There are no Premier League Christians. At the Lord's table, we learn who we are and whose we are. We belong to the one who invites us, the one whose table it is. At the table, we know that we have been created in the image of God, redeemed in Jesus Christ, forgiven and reconciled. Here at this table, the least and the most vulnerable are honored guests. Here, former scorned and dishonest tax collectors, such as Levi, and women from the streets celebrate a new life. Here at this table, returning prodigals get new clothes of respectability, a new ring of dignity, and feast at the Father's banquet. Here we are loved, forgiven sons and daughters of God. And one of the, I think, the hardest things and saddest things about church history is the way that this this act of communion has been abused um, in the church and and there's been corruption 
And at the worst, it became the preserve of a, of, of a certain elite group of the priests who spoke in a language that the common people didn't understand and who made it something that you did in order to earn God's favor, which is just the opposite of what it actually represents. Absolute opposite. It's by grace for all of us that we come to this table. That which was meant to be what we gathered around to bring unity, a sense of being part of God's family, his church, became a cause for disunity, which I think is one of the biggest scandals in church history. Secondly, that idea of it recalling or giving us hope for what will one day be fully realized, that future expectation that is drawn together in this present moment. A foretaste of that which will one day be realized when Jesus comes again and heaven is fully realized on earth. I remind you of that verse again. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, says Paul, you announce the Lord's death until he comes. So the Lord's table around which we gather is a foretaste a future of this future realization. And it should demonstrate the values of this future kingdom. And by that I mean the future kingdom is going to be made up of all nations, every tribe, every type of person who has in their hearts said yes to Jesus. It'll be such a variety, such a diversity, heaven, of people, the fullness of God's creation represented. And therefore, our communion table should reflect that future realization that it is open to all people who in, in their hearts, however small, however small, are saying yes to Jesus. That's, that's what we do here at this church. If you in your heart, however feeble or faint you're, you're saying yes to Jesus is, you are welcome at the table because we're all in that place of needing his grace and mercy. We who are many are one bread, one body, for we all partake of the one bread. In Christ, we have been made part of a new family. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Now, it's not saying there aren't males and females and there aren't Jews and Greeks. It's saying that that doesn't matter. It's saying that everyone, the level playing field, and that is what will one day be fully realized in God's kingdom. And the church is called to be a signpost to that today. A community that is welcoming to all for whom it's a level playing field for them to come and get to know Jesus. That's why this meal that we celebrate, this simple act that we do, is so important and symbolizes so much that is important. Division cannot sit at the table. This is a quote I found. Division cannot sit at the table it buckles under the gentle pressure of God's love. Hurdles to unity and barriers to fellowship and footholds for the devil are all dealt with before enjoying communion. That's why before we take communion, we take a time of reflection. We say, sorry, Lord, sorry for the way that I have lived in a way or have thought things or done things that have not pleased you because we're preparing ourselves and reminding ourselves of the grace and mercy that we all need. And if you think about it, this, in, this future hope of this fullness of the kingdom of God where all people are welcome. Jesus demonstrated, didn't this? He was a window into this, this life, this, this future realization in the, way that, in the way that he lived. There's so much in the gospels of Jesus sitting with people he shouldn't have done at a meal. Isn't there? You know, he was accused of... of, of, of in Luke 5, we're told charges hurled against him that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners. He wasn't eating with the right people. He should, for, for many people, he should have been eating with the, the elites, those who were right before God. And Jesus turned it upside down and said, no, that's not what my kingdom's about. I'm going to eat with these people because they are the people for whom my, God is call, my Father is calling to his kingdom. And we cannot do any less as a church. We have to carry on in the way of Jesus. We're called to carry on in the way of Jesus, in the way that we welcome people to his table. In the invitation and welcome, people, you and I, 
all peoples are enabled to be made whole, to be transformed. It's around the table that the unworthy are reminded that they are made worthy through Jesus. And that this is a reminder of the great banqueting table in heaven around which we are all invited. I prepare a table for you in the middle of your enemies. That's what God says for you. I prepare a table for you where you can feast. And this is a signpost of what will one day be. That's why Paul gets so cross uh, in, later on in Corinthians when he's talking to the Corinthians. And they, they, they start to put to uh, some of the richer people go to communion. And they bring in some of the practice of, of, practice of their past life. And they drink the wine, the best wine. And they eat the food. And they leave they don't leave any for the, the, the other people, for poorer people, for those who uh, are seen as less in society. And if you remember, Paul says, so when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat if you do that, if you behave in that way. This is what he says. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. He doesn't mince his words, does he? If you mess around with what this is meant to represent, it's not good. Because it is so central to who God is, to what he calls his church to be, and what he calls his church to, to represent it was the exact opposite of what the practice of communion was meant to represent. Luke, as well as Matthew and Mark, announced that in Jesus Christ, a new world has dawned. It is the kingdom of God, the reign of God's compassion, justice, generosity, and joy. Around the table, citizens of this new world learn table manners, are formed, and are empowered for ministry in the old world. So that which is true of the new world becomes formed in us now so that we become a sign to the world of what that future realization will one day be. This holy mystery affirms the sharing and bonding experienced at the table, exemplifying the nature of the church, and it models the world as God would have it be. It models the world as God would have it be. So I hope that as we come to communion, just as a reminder of why this is so important and why particularly if we're talking about community, what this meal set represents, what this, this symbolism represents is so central because it's focused on who Jesus was, what he did, in order for you and I to be able to know Jesus, know God, to be right with him, that he took on the shame, he took on the punishment, he took on all the things that were rightfully ours, and he put on his cloak of righteousness onto you and me. So it's not that we're worthy, he makes us worthy by his worthiness. And it's also a sign and a reminder of what will one day be true and fully realized that there is a banqueting table prepared for all peoples of every nation, of every background, and they are welcome at the table. They're welcome at the table. And as a church, we are called to be a signpost of that future kingdom. It, and that's why when we gather around here, we're reminded of that, that that's a key thing of who we are. I would love it if we in our communities started when we eat together, I know some of our communities eat together, and I think it's a really good thing to do. I love it if we broke bread in our communities when we eat together and, just and, and made it a common practice within our communities. We do this and a certain tradition within the church, but I actually think, maybe I should stop recording at this point, but I actually think a truer reflection of what Jesus did in his church is to be found in that first picture we looked at of a meal around a table, the people of God, the community of God, as they spent life together, shared life together, in the middle of the nuts and bolts of life, they regularly broke bread to remind them that that's why we do this. That's who brings us together. And I'd love us to do that in our community. And one of the things I want to do is put out a few resources for community leaders to help us to do that. We'll talk about that another time. So... We're going to invite, uh, we're going to sing, 
it's good to worship and it also gives chance for our young people and children to come back into the service because it would be very wrong for me to talk about this is a level playing field for all people if we didn't invite the children and young people back in to share with us as part of our family. So um, if I can invite Brett to come back up please in the band.